again. I know it's going to be science related, but this is a church. Let's uh, go to the Lord first, please. Father God, we come before your presence in the name of your son Jesus in this place, in this time, with these people gathered together. We have ideas of how this is going to go. You have an idea of how this is going to go. That would be better. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our strength and our redeemer. May your word be shown to be true, and may you glorify yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the topic is starlight and a young earth. This has often been one of the big criticisms leveled against um, biblical literalist uh, creation scientists, basically that the earth is 6,000 years old or about there. And if that's so, then how is it that we can see things in the night sky that are farther away than 6,000 light years? Uh, for instance, the galaxy of Andromeda, our nearest galactic neighbor, is 2 million light years away. That would mean it would take 2 million years for the light to get here. So surely, uh, the critics say, uh, Andromeda and the Earth have both been here for longer than 2 million years. And then there are other galaxies and quasars uh, that are up to 5.7 billion light years away. Well, how does a creationist explain that? There are several older theories. One is that light used to travel slower. Uh, the Barry Setterfield popularized that theory. It was a, an incredibly valuable stepping stone for our understanding on that. Another one was the God created the light in transit theory. Uh, that certainly since uh, in Genesis it says that the sun, the moon, and the stars were for the telling of times and years and seasons, uh, that God would have created the light in place already uh, on its way here instantly. So we would have seen the light here on Earth even though the, uh, the uh, uh, objects emitting the light today are many light years away, many thousands or millions of light years away. Well, that's all possible, of course. Uh, God could have worked it any of those ways. Uh, there is a, a current uh, theory in creation science thinking that is what we call in science elegant and powerful. It has the, uh, the earmarks of being simple, which according to Occam's razor is, is usually the right answer, is usually the simple answer. And most of us know when someone is lying to you, normally the story becomes far more complicated with every new sentence they say. And in science, that seems to be the pattern also. So let me go ahead and uh, show you a little bit about uh, the uh, not just the current uh, creationist thinking, but also the evolutionary thinking. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the Big Bang Theory before I talk about D. Russell Humphrey's white hole cosmology. Okay, that looks like it's working pretty well. Well, most people do recognize the name Sir Isaac Newton. He's the one that's famous for saying what goes up. It's come down, it's sitting under the apple tree and all that. Well, uh, he was known as one of the four great geniuses of science of the uh, past 2,000 years. Sir Isaac Newton was also a very avid believer in God. At the top of his pages of his notes, he would write, to the praise and glory of God, to the praise and glory of God, to the praise and glory of God. He's often also uh, credited with saying, or at least with quoting another scientist whom he appreciated by saying that all of science is thinking God's thoughts after him. You know, it isn't our, our, our job as scientists and science teachers to determine the truth. Our job is to discover the truth, not to decide. I had students at, uh, at uh, Traders Point School yesterday ask me about the planet Pluto. And, uh, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, it's not a planet anymore, right? How many of you heard that they changed it to? Yeah, they changed it. Down. And I told them, well, you know what? Pluto doesn't care whether we call it a planet or not. It, it really doesn't matter. We seem to think that if we get together and vote on something, it becomes so. That's not right. You see, we're supposed to discover what the truth is. And I used to tell my high school classes, when I was teaching high school science, science is really God Appreciation 101. That's what it is. Well, anyway, Isaac Newton, in his book, he says this about the solar system and, and all of the things out there. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets 
could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. And of course, we hear about intelligent design theory all the time these days, and that's uh, the same sort of thinking. This is Werner von Braun. How many ever heard of Werner von Braun? Yes, the head of NASA. He was a Nazi uh, a scientist during World War II, but when America and Russia conquered the Nazi Germany, we split up their rocket scientists. We got Werner von Braun, who actually is a believer in God. Look at what he said in a letter to the California State Board of Education in 1972. One cannot be exposed to the law and order of the universe without concluding that there must be design and purpose behind it all. The better we understand the intricacies of the universe and all it harbors, the more reason we have found to marvel at the inherent design upon which it is based. While the admission of a design for the universe ultimately raises the question of a designer, a subject outside of science, the scientific method does not allow us to exclude data which lead to the conclusion that the universe, life, and man are based on design. To be forced to believe only one conclusion, that everything in the universe happened by chance, would violate the very objectivity of science itself. Dr. Werner von Braun. Well, Christians are often, Bible believers are often cajoled, corralled, and intimidated into thinking, well, we're the non-intellectuals. We're the dummies. We're the not smart people because we, we believe in the Bible, you see. Well, what if the Bible's actually right? You know, archaeology, history, geology, science, uh, all the things, nothing, no fact that's been uncovered by the enterprise of science has ever contradicted with the Bible. Only certain people's theories and interpretations and inferences and guesses and estimates and, and opinions, those have contradicted the Bible, but that's nothing new. It's been that way for millennia. So uh, we're talking facts. As a scientist, I deal in facts logic, data, evidence, you know, hard science, not soft science, evolutionist, soft science, big bang theory is soft science. I mean, how many of you like Calvin and Hobbes? There we go, you have these little Calvin and Hobbes here. Uh, we, we should, we have some of the high schoolers in here, I see, so Calvin and Hobbes and the t-shirt and the sneakers are for you. All right. <clears throat> the problem with people is they don't look at the big picture. Eventually, we're each going to die, our species will go extinct, the sun will explode, and the universe will collapse. Existence is not only temporary, it's pointless. We're all doomed, and worse, nothing matters. I see why people don't like to look at the big picture. Well, it puts a bad day in perspective. <laughs> you know, this was the old big, you know, there's the, the theory of the universe, the evolution's had the big bang, but uh, only until the past two or three years, when we recalibrated the Hubble constant and found out all kinds of other interesting things about the universe, there was something called the big crunch that yes the universe started with a big bang bang and expanded and then it went then it but gravity was going to drag everything back together crunch and then it was going to be a bang again bang crunch bang crunch bang crunch and that was how endless infinity was going to go that was called the oscillating universe theory well now we found out that the there's not enough gravity in the whole universe among all the galaxies to keep them uh, together and draw them back to the center. So there, as a matter of fact, not only are, are they expanding, but they're expanding faster and faster all the time. So uh, your atheistic uh, uh, evolutionary Big Bang theorist scientists decided there must be some force doing this, a mysterious force, and they called it dark energy. Uh, they don't know what it is, but they called it dark energy. Uh, the new uh, head of uh, physics department at Yale says that uh, dark energy is code for we don't have a clue. That's what she said in that article we were reading in Parade Magazine, uh, Nick and Roseanne, we were up in, uh, in uh, New Jersey together recently. Yes, so uh, they don't really have a clue, but you know what the Bible says? He that stretches the heavens as a curtain, he stretches the heavens as a tent upon its pole in which to dwell in. You know, the Bible seems to indicate that God created the universe by stretching it. I know what that dark energy is. <laughs> and it's stretching the universe apart still, faster and faster at an ever-increasing speed. 
the uh, dark energy is, is largely related to the concept that Einstein eventually uh, originally uh, started was uh, the uh, uh, cosmological constant, which Einstein himself said was the greatest blunder of my career. But they still depend on it, even though Einstein said I was wrong about that one. Well, okay. How many people have ever seen this in Parade Magazine? Marilyn Vosavant? Ask Marilyn. She's in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the highest IQ of 228 in the world. She's also the most famous Menzen in the world. I'm also a member of Menza, the high IQ society. But uh, she's, she's more famous than me. But uh, somebody asked her about the Big Bang. And uh, let me go ahead and, and uh, zoom in on this for you here. I texted this for you. Marilyn Vosavant on the Big Bang. She describes it and then says, that just sounds just plain nuts, right? But do you believe it? If so, how do you support your belief that the entire universe was once smaller than a polka dot? With strong, a strong line of reasoning, solid evidence, anything at all? If you cannot, welcome to the world of faith. You're accepting what you've been told by those you respect. Lots of science, far too much is accepted on faith, faith alone. We must be careful not to teach theories as facts. It slows scientific progress immeasurably. Now, I don't want to misrepresent Marilyn Vosavant. She is not a creationist. But she also thinks that we should uh, take these things with a bit of a grain of salt when there's no proof and everyone talks like it's real. Well, we've got the universe. We have to explain it. It's here. We're here. Life exists. And it's, it doesn't have to be by evolution. I have had the, the vice president of the Darwin Coalition in Knoxville, Tennessee, said to me one time, well, I don't see how anyone could believe what you believe. And so I started telling him what I believed. And he evidently didn't really mean the question because he got very impatient with me. Uh, and, and, then I, and then I said to him, well, okay, well, what, what evidence do you have that evolution's true? And he said, well, you and I are standing here having this conversation right now. How else could that be? unless evolution was true. And, well, of course, it could have been that, you know, uh, Lucky the Leprechaun, the magically delicious, he could have made us, you know, and that would still be true. So no matter how you believe the universe and life got started, uh, it did get started somehow. And uh, you can't just say, because we're here, I'm right. You know, it's got to be some way that only your idea could be true that this would happen, you see, uh, for you to use it as proof. Well, look at this. Some people think that they've got the Big Bang thing all figured out and, and, and they proved it and scientists are all right about this. Look at this. This is a quote from just three years ago in American Scientist magazine, a professor at McGill University says this, where did matter come from? The best theories of the origin of the universe still fail to explain how the universe managed not to turn up MD. Well, I'm going to explain to you why they have a problem with that, but they have not proved the Big Bang, and they do not have any data for it. Uh, the, the universe spreading out, it goes along with Scripture. He stretches the heavens, and I'll show you some more verses on that, and that is the, the uh, uh, prevailing creationist theory right now. At least it's the trendy one we've got. It's just a theory. It's our theory. We can't prove it, but it goes along with the facts. It's simple, elegant, and powerful. Max Planck, a personal friend of Albert Einstein and colleague of his, said this, whenever an experimental finding contradicts the accepted theory, another step on the ladder of progress is thereby announced. For the contradiction signifies that the accepted theory must be overhauled and improved. Well, I would suggest that the Big Bang Theory needs to be overhauled and improved or just, just trashed. This fellow here it would agree with me, Eric Lerner. He is not a creationist. He is a cosmic string theorist. From what I understand, he believes in the super string theory. How many of you ever heard of cosmic string theory? String theory for the, for the universe. There you go. I know that Roseanne has. Let's see. And so Eric Lerner wrote a book called The Big Bang Never Happened. Uh, Dr. Lerner, oh, he is the president of, uh, hold on, let me go back to, well, he's the president of Lawrenceville Plasma Physics. So he is, he's not just some local yokel. He's... He's in the industry. And uh, what he has had to say, and this was in New Scientist magazine of 2004, and uh, Dr. Lerner is the president. Also, he, 
He had 300, uh, three, 33 other scientists from 10 different countries one of, signed this, signed this little letter. There was an open letter to the scientific community in New Scientist magazine. Uh, one of the people who signed that was my old astronomy professor at George Mason University, Minos Kafatos. He was a Greek, you know, Minos. Anyway, and uh, now there's over 400 scientists that have signed this. Uh, you can go to the uh, website and take a look at that yourself. Bucking the Big Bang is the title of this uh, letter. He said, ideas about the history of the universe are dominated by Big Bang theory, but its dominance rests more on funding decisions than on the scientific method, according to Eric Lerner and dozens of other scientists. So uh, let's take a look at some of the criticisms that Dr. Lerner uh, leveled against the Big Bang theory in this uh, article. The Big Bang today relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities. Hey, a hypothesis is an educated guess. Okay. It's a growing number of guesses. Things that we've never observed. Things like inflation, dark matter, and dark energy are the most prominent examples of this. Now, one of the things I told you I was going to say is, why did the universe not turn up empty? You see, if you take all the mathematical equations for the Big Bang and you calculate them backwards, you get that the universe started with a 50-50 mixture of half and half matter and antimatter. Now, all you Star Trek fans know, if you mix matter and antimatter, what happens? Kabish! That's right. Matter and antimatter, if they touch, will mutually destroy each other. So if the universe started out by Big Bang, you'd have had a mix of 50-50 matter and antimatter, and it all just would have gone until there'd be nothing left. And the universe would have ended right there. That's why they're saying, well, this is a mystery. How come the universe didn't end up empty? Well, they decided to throw a little fudge factor into those equations. And that fudge factor, just like a remainder in a long division equation uh, uh, problem, it gives you a tiny remainder of matter. And in the matter-antimatter wars, uh, that little bit of matter was the remnant. That 50-50 man-on-man thing with the uh, matter and antimatter ended up with a little teeny bit of matter left over. And that's our whole universe. Our planet, our star, all the stars in our galaxy, and all the galaxies in the local cluster and the superclusters, and the entire universe is that remainder. Now, that only works if protons spontaneously decay, but we've never seen a proton spontaneously decay. And I asked a Big Bang theorist, a doctoral student at the University of Tennessee Knoxville, I said, well, since protons don't spontaneously decay, how can your fudge factor be true? And he said, well, protons do spontaneously decay. It's just that they have a half-life of 10 to the 40th years, and that's why we've never seen that. You know, that's a 10, a 1, with 40 zeros after it. That is a trillion, trillion times longer than they think the universe is old. So that's just basically putting it way out there so that uh, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't check on it. And uh, uh, last night we heard Will Rogers quoted. I like Will Rogers. He said... Scientists get bigger and bigger reputations the more they talk about things you can't check on. That's true. I'll just relegate that. That's the same reason the Easter Bunny is real, is because he runs too fast for you to see him. You know, what we started in a little church in, in Fort Wayne last year was the saying, let the bunny go. So I say, let the Big Bang go too. Dr. Lerner goes on to say, without these guesses, there would be a fatal contradiction between the observations made by the astronomers and the predictions of the Big Bang Theory. In other words, what they believe and what we see would be totally fatal to their theory without these assumptions, these guesses they make. In no other field of physics would this continual recourse to new hypothetical objects be accepted as a way of bridging the gap between theory and observation. In other words, between what you think and what we see. It would, at the least, raise serious questions about the validity of the underlying theory. Another thing we've observed in science is the patterns of all the galaxies in the universe. It seems like we're near a center part of the universe, and there's like this ring of galaxies around us, and then, like layers of an onion, there's a big gap of space, and then there's another ring or a shell of galaxies around that, around that, around that. They all have the same center. It's a concentric distribution, like balloons inside of balloons. And according to Big Bang, there's no center.
to the universe anywhere, but there seems to actually be a focal point of the universe. Even observations, things we see through our telescopes and we detect in our radio telescopes, even observations are now interpreted through this biased filter, the Big Bang filter, judged right or wrong depending on whether or not they support the Big Bang. So even things we see, they go, oh, that doesn't count because it doesn't go with the Big Bang Theory. It can't be true. So discordant data on redshifts, lithium and helium abundances, and galaxy distribution, which I just mentioned to you, among other topics, are ignored or ridiculed. This reflects a growing dogmatic mindset that is alien to the spirit of free scientific inquiry. And there's, I've got all the references. You know, I always reference things. Uh, you know, you don't have to believe anything I tell you. You just can look it up yourself and see that, yes, I'm not fooling you. And I don't want you to go out there and talk to unbelievers and talk to atheists and talk to evolutionists and talk to unbelieving professors or Bible critics. I don't want you to go out there and talk to them and have a gun that shoots blanks. <laughs> I want you to be fully loaded with truth. Then, use it wisely. Ask God. Does any man lack wisdom? Let him ask of God, who giveth freely and upbraideth not. For uh, James 1, uh, 5. Uh, and he that handleth knowledge aright is wise. So the knowledge that you're going to gain from all the speakers this week at the Expo, pray to God for wisdom how to use that right. You just slap some high school biology teacher up and down with this stuff, and you're just going to be a pain, that's all. <laughs> You're not going to be a witness. There's a time for all that. And I wish I knew how to tell you exactly when the time is to be entreating and when the time is to be combative. Jesus always knew, didn't he? He knew when to say, you're a den of thieves. You're not far from the kingdom of heaven. Go and sin no more. And are you a teacher of Israel? Know not these things. Jesus always knew. And I don't think he was cheating and using his God powers for that. I think he was listening to the Holy Spirit. He told us when the Spirit comes, when the Comforter comes, he will show you all things. He will remind you the things I have taught. He'll convince the world of sin. And, uh, and, and also the Bible says, think not what you ought to say when you're brought before the kings and rulers and magistrates, but the Holy Spirit will give you utterance. Well, that's how we creation scientists win every debate with evolutionists. I tell people during debates, I cheat, of course. The Creator keeps passing me notes with the answers. <laughs> okay. Also, there's, there's one other. I don't want to go into the technical of it, but there should be, according to the microwave map of the universe, the, the shadows should all be oriented a certain way. Well, or actually not oriented any certain way if the Big Bang is true, and we do see an orientation. So it, that also was something relatively new that threw off the Big Bang theory. But it has tremendous difficulties here, there, and about in a lot of ways. And there are many scientists that are becoming impatient with, uh, with just a theory being popular rather than right. Uh, this fellow here, D. Russell Humphreys, is the originator of the white hole cosmology, or the stretching the universe theory of, of, of how God created the universe and how the universe really was, was originated. I find it very refreshing that creation scientists have a new trend these days of first we look to the Bible for clues and then we research to see not whether God did it that way, but how he did it that way. And that's what Dr. Humph he found a whole bunch of verses in the Bible that talked about the stretching idea. And so he came up with the white hole cosmology. Now, Dr. Humphreys is an award-winning physicist retired from Sandia National Laboratories. He was a government scientist. Uh, also, Dr. Humphrey's creation-based, Bible-based, planet-forming theory correctly predicted the magnetic field strengths of the planets Uranus and Neptune before the probes got there and measured it. Now, in scientists, that is cash in the bank, man. If your theory predicts something that nobody knows whether it's true or not, and then later you, your prediction turns out to be right, you're, you know, everyone puts you up on the shoulders and runs you out of the, you know, of the arena saying you're the hero. Of course, since Dr. Humphreys is a creationist, we, we don't get too much of that. How many of you have ever heard of the MRI machine? MRI. Did you know a creationist invented that? Dr. Raymond Damadian. He's never going to get the Nobel Prize. The Academy would never allow a creationist to get the Nobel Prize. A professor in Texas just this year said 
a, a creationist should not be able to become a scientist. Eugenie Scott, the head of the National Center for Science Education, commented on uh, Marcus Ross getting his uh, doctoral degree from Rhode, uh, University of Rhode Island uh, this past year. Uh, Marcus is a, a young professor now at Liberty University. How many you know Liberty University? Yeah, this morning I was teaching a class on the internet at Liberty University. I teach two courses on creation there. But uh, Marcus is a fine young man, and, and uh, Dr. Scott said, I would never allow a creationist to even begin a doctoral degree program at a university. It would just take too much time to re-educate them. So uh, we're not terribly, we're the Rodney Dangerfields of the world of science. Well, here are some of these verses I was talking about, and they're all through the Bible. You can, you can write down the references if you want. I'll keep this up for a little bit. But he stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. By the way, that hangeth the earth upon nothing, it was an insane thing to say back in those days because the other civilized cultures of the world believed that Atlas was holding the earth on his shoulders. That would have been the Romans and the Greeks. They believed that the, uh, the, the advanced civilization in India, the Hindus, believed that uh, the earth was on the backs of some elephants that were standing on a turtle. And it made sense the earth should have to rest on something. But the Hebrews wrote, he hangs the earth upon nothing, which was the dumbest, most crazy sounding thing. But guess what? It was true. The earth does hang upon nothing. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. By the way, the Hebrew word for circle and sphere are the same, so it doesn't mean the world's flat. we we'll just get over that. Okay. <laughs> he stretched out the heavens as a curtain, spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. He's made the earth by his power, established the world by wisdom, and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. He bowed the heavens. He spread it out the heavens. He spread out the sky. He bowed or arched the heavens also. He stretches out the heavens, created the heavens and stretched them out. Stretched forth the heavens. Stretched out the heavens. Spanned the heavens. Stretched forth the heavens. Stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Stretches forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth. Yeah, I typed all those into my PowerPoint sitting at a train station in, I think it was St. Augustine, Texas, or really... Anyway, we travel by Amtrak a lot. <laughs> but uh, those are all King James, in case you're a King Jimmy fan. Okay. Uh, but uh, these verses all tend to indicate that that's how God created the universe. And you know, if God stretched the universe out, and even the Big Bang Theory guys believe what I'm about to tell you is true, it wasn't that all the stars and planets and galaxies were flung out into space. It's that space with those things in it, was flung out into nothingness. We have a hard time understanding nothing. We have a hard time understanding infinity. That's because our minds are finite and we cannot, it doesn't register. We do not know what infinity is. We make a sideways eight and we think we're on top of it. That's not true. We, no one can imagine what infinity is. No one can imagine what endless amounts of things are, and no one can imagine what nothingness is. Space is not nothing. There are atoms floating around in space. There's one every couple inches out in space. You know, here, of course, there's gazillions of them for every you know, micrometer. Uh, well, anyway, um, if space itself was stretched, that means something. Albert Einstein is, of course, famous for his equation e equals mc squared. He's also famous for supporting the Occam's razor by saying everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler than that. <laughs> but if E equals MC squared is true, nuclear energy should work, gravity should bend light, black holes are possible, and if you stretch space, the fabric of space, you stretch the fabric of space-time. If you stretch space, you stretch time. If God indeed has created the universe by stretching it out, then time would be stretched with the space. And on the edges, just like stretching a piece of silly putty that just smashed onto the Sunday comics to make, I don't know, Charlie Brown's face get bigger. If you stretch space at the edges, it would be stretched more than at the center, where we probably are near the center. D. Russell Humphreys made the calculation. He made the calculation that if space was stretched, to that much that the time would be stretched enough that uh, the stars would appear in our sky while four Earth days passed here, 
billions, tens of billions of years, well, well at least the, the, the 14 billion years, would have passed at the edge of the known universe. He had, that little book that I showed you a copy of there, and I'll show you again, Starlight and Time costs like seven or eight dollars, and it, it's a little technical, uh, but to, most of the technical calculus calculations are in the appendix, and you don't have to read that part if you don't want to. <laughs> but the, but uh, Starlight and Time, this is the, the currently the most popular creationist theory on the universe. Look, if God actually stretched out space, Humphreys thinks that perhaps God did that by a white hole. A black hole is supergravity, a white hole is super anti-gravity. Now the evolutionists believe in, in dark energy and that's anti-gravity, so we can believe in anti-gravity too. So a white hole would be black hole in reverse. And so that would throw, this is Humphreys theory now, that would throw the whole universe out from the center. Now, once the universe is stretched out as far as God wants it to be stretched out, then he'd convert the white hole into a black hole. And there is a zone around every black hole called the event horizon. How many have ever even heard the term event horizon? The event horizon is the, the limits to uh, where things can possibly, possibly escape from the black hole's gravity. If you're closer than the event horizon, that's it. You're getting sucked in, point of no return. Well, the event horizon of the white hole would be, instead of folded close, unfolded out. Well, when it turns into a black hole, the event horizon would find itself at the edge of the known universe, you know, 12, 15 billion light years away. Well, when it turns into a black hole, the event horizon would come rushing back to the center. Believe it or not, I am simplifying this. <laughs> the event horizon would come rushing back to the center, dragging the light beams with it because of the space-time dilation. Read the book, it explains it better. There's also a little 20-minute video called Starlight and Time. <laughs> I don't know if we have it at the table out there, but it explains it very well, too. Dr. Humphreys is a, is a pretty good lecturer, also. Well, it turns out Earth is sitting here near the center, the event horizon comes rushing back, and all of a sudden, shoo, all the stars appear in the sky, shoo, right when the event horizon passes us, dragging the starlight behind it through the time dilation of the space stretching. Okay. He calculated it would have been exactly four Earth days of time would have passed here before the light returned and also the, uh, uh, the, at the edges of the universe, 13, 14, 15 billion years would have passed. Four Earth days. If you look in Genesis, that's not just a coincidence. It says that on the fourth day, he created the sun, the moon, and the stars also. Kind of added, and the stars also. Well, this is, this is Dr. Humphrey's theory. He says, hey, it's just a theory. Uh, I, I, I'm more comfortable as a scientist with this theory than the light created in transit theory, or the, uh, the uh, C decay equals mc squared. The C is the speed of light. So saying that the speed of light is less now than it used to be I'm less comfortable with that. Uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner, uh, our creationist stellar astronomer, uh, said to me in an email that, well, you know, if, if C was much different in the past, every atom in the universe would fall apart. Now, of course, that's all still up for, for debate and, and discussion, too. But it's, this is a reputable scientist who is a creationist who has come up with a plausible explanation, a theory on the origin of the universe that is biblically based, it's, it's biblically sound, it's scientifically sound, and no matter what you believe about how the universe got started, it will be a fantastical, tough-to-swallow idea. Because no matter how you think the universe got started, it's one wild story. I mean, which is better, that God stretched out the universe, or that the universe created itself by a quantum fluctuation, whatever that is, and then it suddenly became the size of the head of a pin. Then in the first 100 thousandth of a second, it became the size of an orange. And then it exploded, and we got everything. Gives me some scientific problems. Whatever happened required a miracle. And it's whether you see design in it or not. Many astronomers haven't necessarily become Bible believers, but a large portion of, of astronomer scientists say there must be a god. Dr. Charles Towns, who won the Nobel Prize in 1964, said this in Newsweek magazine of 1998 in an article called Science Finds God. 
He, he got the Nobel Prize for inventing the maser, and then there was a whole bunch of arguments about whether that is the same thing as a laser or not, but that gets into technical legal stuff, and scientists don't care about that any more than Pluto cares about whether you think it's a planet or not. And so I called it a laser. Yeah, Dr. Charles Towns said this, somehow, somehow, intelligence must have been involved in the laws of the universe. The universe is just so orderly and beautiful. Most astronomers, um, like Sir Fred Hoyle, the creator of the steady state theory of the universe, uh, many astronomers have decided there's got to be a god. You know, it could be anybody, it could be Jehovah, you know, it could be Thor, but there's got to be a god because the universe just couldn't be this way without somebody doing it. So we've got galaxies, stars, clusters of galaxies, super clusters of galaxies, rings of these super clusters, all concentrically aligned around the Milky Way galaxy where we live. There are other evidences too, I've got about 10 minutes here before we take our break, other evidences too of a young Earth, besides the, uh, the apologetic, if you want to call it that, of the white hole cosmology and the stretching space theory, which I just mentioned. Uh, there's the atmospheric helium. How much helium is there in the atmosphere of the Earth? Uh, because all radioactive things do release helium. Dr. Larry Vardaman, a creation scientist, said, calculated that based on the amount of helium in our atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere couldn't be any older than two million years. Two million years max, which 6,000 years fits in. Uh, Humphreys, uh, the guy who invented the theory I just talked about and correctly predicted the magnetic field strengths of Neptune and Uranus, said this, that the Earth's magnetic field, based on his planet-forming theory, the Earth's magnetic field can't be any older than 9,000 years max. And I'm going to go into detail on that. Danny Faulkner, a stellar astronomer, also short period comets, a long-standing uh, criticism against uh, uh, the ancient universe theories of evolutionists and big bangers, and also the Poynting-Robertson effect. Uh, I'll go into these two in detail later. Let me go ahead and mention what the Poynting-Robertson effect is. Uh, you see, things that are floating, when I got this from Harold Slusher, actually, you know, um, uh, who explained this, that uh, little teeny things in the, in, that are floating around, like little dust specks floating around in our solar system, when the sun's rays hit them, uh, the, they just re-radiate the sun's rays out the back end and they come rushing towards the sun and get sucked into the sun by the sun's radiation. Now, objects that are too big to re-radiate the uh, radiation out the back end and come zooming towards the sun just absorb the hit. They take the hit on the front and then these things like the sizes of pebbles and boulders, they get hit by the sun's radiation and they get pushed away. So big things get swept out of our solar system, little things get swept into the sun. Within a few thousand years, maybe tens of thousands of years, our entire solar system should have been swept clean. You know, well, tens of thousands of years, many tens of thousands of years. Now, what we actually find is there's plenty of debris floating around in our solar system. We've got the asteroid belt. We've got all these little, you know, we see shooting stars all the time, not just during meteor showers. Most shooting stars are only the size of a grain of sand. You can see them from many miles away because they, they light up so brightly when they incinerate. But uh, the pointing robertson effect is also an evidence. Uh, spiral arms of our galaxy, the, you know that the, the Milky Way galaxy is like a frisbee, but it's more like a propeller than a frisbee, and these arms should have blended into a solid frisbee disk after ten turns around, and the arms are still distinct. There's some problems there. The spiral wave density theory is a, is a, a big bang apologetic for that, which is which has uh, not been proved, but it's a theory. The missing mass problem. Uh, this is why you always hear about dark matter, uh, because our galaxy only has 10% of the stars with gravity enough to hold together that's necessary. Otherwise, our, all the stars would just fly away from each other, and they, they wouldn't be attracted to each other. There's not enough gravity. When you count all the stars up and count up all their gravity, it's only one-tenth of what's needed. So, since the galaxy must be incredibly ancient uh, by Big Bang timescales, uh, for our galaxy, then, uh, then uh, there must be ten times more gravity somewhere. And I'm not saying there's not such a thing as black holes or dark stars out there with supergravity. I'm just saying uh, Big Bang Theory needs it and needs lots of them and needs a supermassive black hole, an, SB, uh, an M SMBH at the middle of every galaxy, maybe two or even three trillion times 
the, uh, the gravity of our, our sun. And globular clusters being too old, we find clusters of stars that the clusters are too old for the stars that are in them. The clusters are supposed to be old, but these stars are really young, according to the color of them and the, the size of them. And according to stellar evolution theory, a certain color and a certain size means a certain age. Well, it could mean that God just likes red, blue, and yellow, and orange, and brown stars, you know, and makes them that way from the beginning. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and let me, let me just uh, take the next five minutes and go into the, the details I was talking about with the ghost craters on the moon. This is the moon, obviously, and the big thing people always talk about on the moon is craters. Well, if you look up close, you can see that some craters are huge, like these maria uh, or the seas. And when you look at the man on the moon, the face of the man on the moon, there's the dark gray areas and the light gray areas. The dark gray areas are actually lava that filled up an ancient crater. Some, some asteroid smacks into the moon's surface, bursts open the ground, and up will well up through the crack in the, in the crust of the moon, uh, at least in, back in the days when the moon's core was hot enough and there was magma or melted lava under the surface. It will well up inside and fill up this crater just like you fill up a cereal bowl full of milk. And the crater will get swamped with this, and then it will, it will freeze that way. It's basalt, so it's a darker colored rock and you'll get this plane of lava. Well, that's what you see in the Maria. Of course, after that forms, new craters can form on that fresh lava surface. And uh, evolutionists believe, of course, that you know uh, we're talking about a meteor impact every thousand years or something, that there's so many meteor impacts, so many craters. Well, that's okay. The moon's supposed to be 4.6 billion years old, and 3.8 billion years ago, there was a great, uh, the, the, uh, a great impact uh, 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 episode, and then there was the lesser impact episode, and with all of that, you, you get all these craters. Well, of course, creationists believe that the moon's only 6,000 years old, and the moon's only been sitting there for 6,000 years taking these crater hits. Well, according to us, then, you'd have to have the meteors hitting far more often, and here's a proof that that's exactly how it happened. When you look at the moon's surface, you see some things called ghost craters. See the rim of that crater there? This is a, a, a photograph, an image from the book Comet, written by Carl Sagan in 1985. And uh, what it says here, in the, it says a photograph of the sparsely created lunar uh, lowlands. The largest sharp crater in the image is the Flamstein crater, named after Britain's first uh, astronomer royal, chapter three. Visible beneath crater Flamstein is an, a, a lava flooded ancient crater from the earliest history of the moon. Well now, yeah, that's, that's true. But the ghost crater here, you see, when the Maria is created by an asteroid smacking in, and this crater then fills up with this dark colored lava which freezes, how could you get this? A crater under the lava. You see, when the asteroid hit, it should have completely flattened everything for hundreds of miles, flat the crater would have been wiped out. So the crater must have been formed before, right after the meteor hit and just before the lava filled up the crater. There's no other explanation. There's no other logic. There's nothing else that could be the truth. But for two meteors to hit in such a close amount of time, must mean that meteors were flying at the moon pretty fast. I mean, we're talking about, at the most, a week later, something like that. So that crater that you see is in the middle of a giant crater of Maria, and it was formed sometime very soon after the original big impact, and then it was flooded over with lava, and then new, new craters are on top of the lava. Well, these ghost craters are not super rare. They're all over the moon, and uh, this is just evidence that the cratering episodes happen much faster than evolutionists believe, far more plausible in the 6,000 year time frame for our theories instead. Uh, the short period comets, that can be easily explained also in a creationist frame point, but not in an evolutionary frame point. You see, um, Halley's Comet comes back how often? Every 75 years, I mean, uh, Mark Twain said, I came in with Halley's Comet, I'm going out with Halley's Comet. And, by gosh, he did, didn't he? He died the year of Halley's Comet, uh, 76 years later. Well, comets, when they get close to the sun, 
the solar radiation throws that tail of gas out the back end of the comet. And it doesn't matter whether the comet is heading towards the sun or heading away. On its way back out, the tail flies in front of it. Just like if the wind is blowing a little flag on your car antenna, I don't know, that says Colts on it or something, you know, a little flag on your car antenna. If the wind is blowing faster forward than your car is going forward, that little flag is going to flap in front of you. Well, that's what happens to the uh, tail of the comet. Now, that's a pretty uh, uh, heavy dose of a rush of radiation that's flying out of the sun at these little ice balls floating through space we call the comets. Now, as a result, what happens is the comet melts and vaporizes. The tail is made of a whole bunch of vaporized comet material, mostly ice and gas and dust and things like that. But um, a comet can only take so many close uh, vacations near the sun before it finally disintegrates. We did see one comet uh, recently disintegrate uh, uh, into three different parts while it was flying around the sun. We also saw uh, the Shoemaker-Levy comet uh, hit the planet Jupiter in about 18 different pieces. Now, these comets actually do break up, so they can't take too many turns around the sun. Halley's Comet just couldn't have been going around the sun for 4.6 billion years. Uh, it, it, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years, maybe tens of thousands of years, before these things finally fall apart, maybe even only thousands, period. But Halley's Comet is still there. So uh, what was the idea? The evolutionists then said, okay, well, there is a deep storage of comets a thousand times farther from the sun than Earth is. That's just way out there far enough. You can't check on it, okay? And these comets are floating out there. And every once in a while, a black hole or something floats near us and jiggles one of these comets out of this comet shell called the Oort cloud, named after the Dutch astronomer Oort. The Oort cloud perturbates by these uh, black holes and zoom, it just kicks a new comet to refresh the supply of comets around our sun. And that's their story and they're sticking to it. Now there's the, the Kuiper belt, which is actually closer in, you know, within the, the orbit of Pluto or so, it's very thick, but that's possible. That's possibly true that comets are coming from the Kuiper belt. But the Kuiper belt would be huge amounts tinier than the Oort comet cloud, and to suggest that it could have supplied fresh comets for 4.6 billion years, the amount we see now is, is silly. The Oort cloud, uh, Carl Sagan himself said in 1985, many scientific papers are written each year about the Oort cloud, its properties, its origin, its evolution, yet there is not a shred of di direct observational evidence for its existence. Uh, it's theoretical, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with making assumptions and guesses and hypotheses and theories. Nothing wrong. Just don't package it and sell it as a fact. Don't do that. So uh, uh, this is just a summary of the things that we just mentioned, and uh, that's the end of what I need to do. I think we're going to have a break. I think we're going to have a question and answer panel time uh, very shortly after the break in which any questions about this presentation or any matter having to do with the creation evolution controversy of interest just here can be answered. We'll have several of our speakers. Is that not right, Pastor Boyd? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. So let's give him a great big hand.